All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Judith Houck. Dr. Houck is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin. She obtained her master's and PhD from the Department of History of Science at the University of Wisconsin. She focuses on women's studies, medical and science history. She has an impressive CV with multiple awards, grants, and publications. She also has a book titled Hot and Bothered, Women, Medicine, and Menopause in Modern America. I just think it's a great title, I don't want to read the book. Um, so without further ado, here's Dr. Hope. also the name of a lot of um, erotica, and so I can just <laughs> imagine people ordering my book and thinking, where's the good parts? <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to share uh, stories about menopause today. Um, but so I am um, a historian of women's health, and I'm presently writing a history of the women's health movement in the United States. So, and I am grateful for and delighted by the opportunity to share some of my work with the Department of obstetrics and gynecology. So I thought what I'd do today is just sort of share an overview of the women's health movement, um, describing some of its central projects and um, highlighting some of its products. So the women, women's health, as an arena of interest, began to attract the attention of the larger women's movement by the end of the 1960s. Typically, historians mark the beginning um, of the women's health movement with the Women's Liberation Conference in Boston in 1969 that included a uh, path-breaking discussion on women and their bodies. The unexpected enthusiasm for this topic led a group of Boston women to develop a community course based on their experience of health, illness, and embodiment. Perhaps you've heard of this. Um, this course quickly became the path-breaking feminist health resource, Our Bodies, Ourselves. Now, Our Bodies, Ourselves, as you may or may not know, has gone through something like 30 editions. And just last year, um, they have announced that they are no longer putting out a book version. But it had, it had a quite a run. Now, meanwhile, on the other coast, uh, um, abortion activist Patricia McGinnis Lina Fallane and Rowena Gurner founded the Society for Humane Abortion to agitate for the repeal of all abortion laws, build a transnational network um, to assist U.S. women seeking abortions in Mexico, and to publicize methods of self-abortion. By the early 1970s, these health-centered activities had become an identifiable plank the women's movement. More than 1,200 women's groups offered some sort of health services, and tens of thousands of individual women considered themselves participants in a women's health movement. Now, in my talk today, I'm going to focus on three projects and goals of the women's health movement. So we're going to look at women, the demand for women's health in women's hands, we're going to look at women-centered or feminist abortion provision, what was a feminist abortion. And then finally, we're going to um, look at the demand for lesbian health matters. Now, many of the goals of this first um, project, Women's Health in Women's Hands, are presented in this iconic symbol of the women's health movement. This never gets old to me. Um, and let me, let me unpack it a little bit. Clearly, you thought Wonder Woman. Um, what more do I need to say? Um, and she is holding her speculum. Um, so suggesting resting control of um, stealing medical technology away from the medical profession, putting it in women's hands, so symbolizing women's health and women's hands. She's also vanquishing institutions that try to oppress women by controlling their bodies, um, by controlling their bodies. So it's hard to see, but this is reference to Planned Parenthood. This is the AMA. This also is the AMA. Um, 
here is a cross, um, perhaps a crucifix, right? The Catholic Church. This says um, zero population growth. Um, our friend Freud, right? So here she is stomping on all these male um, institutions of oppression. And clearly she is liberated, scrappy, strong, um, not submissive to anybody. So the practice most often associated with this project is self-help, sometimes known, and this is a, it's a technical term rather than a more generic self-help. Now it's sometimes also known as cervical self-exam and sometimes called self-help on ecology. Now self-help was invented in a Los Angeles feminist bookstore in 1971 at a gathering organized by abortion activist Carol Downer. Now, Downer invited a group of women working at, um, a group of women working together to consider opening their own illegal abortion facility staffed by non-medically trained um, health workers. This would have been similar to the Jane Collective in Chicago, if you have any um, awareness of that. Now, at this meeting to talk about abortion politics, Downer hitched up her skirt, scooted up onto a table, um, pulled down her underpants, and inserted a plastic speculum into her vagina. This was very unexpected. Um, <laughs> with the aid of a flashlight, a mirror, and after some readjustment, um, Downer found her cervix. She then invited other women at the meeting to gather around to peek into an arena long understood to be off limits to non-medical eyes. And the self-help and cervical self-exam was born. Now for Downer and many of the women who shared the view, this moment symbolized the reclamation of women's bodies from the men who had long controlled them. Physicians, husbands, fathers, priests. Um, for many of these women, a speculum, a flashlight, and a mirror promised liberation. Because of self-help's apparent promise, Downer and others were eager to share their discovery. She chose a national organization for women's convention in Los Angeles um, in the summer of 1971 for self-help's next public showing. The venue allowed word of mouth, uh, word of self-help to spread to find its audiences across the nation. As a result, now chapters and other women's groups inundated Downer with requests to share her technique. In response, she and another health self-help pioneer, Lorraine Rothman, elaborated and standardized a cervical self-exam demonstration and set out on the road, stopping in church basements, music festivals, college campuses, living rooms, school cafeterias, and hotel rooms. Um, it's hard to sort of um, get across the excitement for this idea. Um, this is in these settings, to largely supportive, um, if not always enthusiastic audiences, a facilitator began by um, showing slides. The slides showed and identified um, what the audience would eventually see in person. The vaginal walls, um, the hymen tags, the cervix, and the eyes. The presentation highlighted how women's bodies changed over the course of their menstrual cycle and over the course of their lives. To this end, the, demonstrated, the demonstration included slides of services during ovulation, pregnancy, and menstruation. Perhaps most significantly, the slides tried to capture the range of female variation, implicitly reconceiving as normal many conditions um, medically considered pathological. Indeed, by showing photos of tipped uteri and services exhibiting uh, yeast imbalances, these slides challenged how medicine had created and deployed the very categories of normal and abnormal. After the slideshow, the facilitator would demonstrate how to use a speculum and give each woman um, the opportunity to view a willing volunteer's 
perineum. If the settings were small and private enough, the women in the audience might be invited um, to view their own um, interiors. So the goals of this demonstration are so modest, but strategically important to the women's health movement. They were meant to provide a basic roadmap of women's bodies. You know, so this is before this is before the internet, right? So women had very little knowledge of basic anatomy. Um, so it provided a basic map of women's bodies. And it was meant to encourage and validate curiosity about their, those bodies, um, to chip away at women's bodily shame, and to inspire and. Um, discussion and trust among women. So this is not something that you are supposed to do alone, and you're always supposed to do it with a group of other women. Um, so most ambitiously, um, they attempted to recruit women into a self-help movement that could wrest control of women's bodies, particularly their reproductive bodies, from the medical profession, and thereby furthering the cause of women's liberation. For many in the audience, these demonstrations were powerful. For some, they were life-changing. Um, there are stories, more than one story, of women selling their houses, moving across the country to come and work with Downer in California. Um, people quit school, uh, sometimes you're just looking for a reason to quit school, and um, <laughs> take up the cause, you know what happens, right? Um, but, um, but I want to give you a sense, at least in one ex um, moment, of perhaps what this felt like. In the summer of 73, city sisters, all the sisters, um, from Portland and Eugene brought self-help to Mountain Grove, an intentional community in southern um, Oregon. Jean um, described, quote, the revolutionary afternoon filled with self-examination, brownies, ice cream, <laughs> guitars, and singing. We lay on our backs, feet to the big sun-filled window. Our awareness of nudity and modesty faded in the presence of women like ourselves, all eager, barefoot, laughing, thoughtful, encouraging, curious. Jean Cervix um, was initially elusive, but she and her self-help partner um, persevered. No, not yet. Try the left, push down a little. There, what a sense of accomplishment. After Jean's success, she helped another woman in her community with her church, her search. I went back to help hold the mirror, to offer my knees to a struggling woman as she tried to catch that first glimpse of the inner hidden gateway to her uterus. At that moment, to join um, the thousands of sisters who are facing their fears, their feelings of shame and uncleanliness, their ignorance, and asking for knowledge to control their bodies and their lives. So really feeling like this, you were something, part of something bigger, you were connected <coughs> to women that you would never meet across the country, um, reclaiming and viewing their bodies. Mm -hmm. Self-help and cervical self-exam were not endpoints, however, for the effort to return women's health to women's hands. Health feminists also funded, founded women's health clinics that put the self-help um, philosophy to practice on a larger scale. So this is um, a feminist health clinic in Chico, um, California. In addition to, um, at these clinics, um, feminists taught self-help and encouraged self-help uh, sort of education courses based on self-help, but they also provided health services that relied almost exclusively on lay health workers instead of physicians. Lay health workers performed the, um, the pelvic exams, fitted diaphragms, treated yeast um, infections or, or imbalances as they were careful to um, be described. In these clinics, physicians were generally, uh, not exclusively, um, hired only to provide abortions. Um, um, so they often provided these services in a group, in a group which was called participatory clinic. 
so women could learn from each other and see each other as um, experts. So imagine to come, uh, coming in with um, a desire to be fitted for a diaphragm. You would be, do this in a group of other women. Um, okay, so that's women's health and women's hands. So let's talk about um, feminist abortions now. So women active in the women's health movement firmly believed that abortion provision was necessary to women's self-determination. Many feminist health clinics opened specifically to provide um, to meet the need for women's abortion care. They understood, however, that abortion provision attracted a variety of practitioners, many motivated primarily by profit. Health Feminists then argued that not all abortions, not even all safe, legal, and affordable abortions equally benefited women, and they urged women to make politically informed decisions in the abortion marketplace. They suggested guidelines for choosing a provider and warned women away from particular practitioners and institutions. Now, health feminists insisted that abortion should be a positive experience. Um, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a claim. Abortion should be a positive experience and outline what women should expect from their provider. In addition to advocating for um, particular procedures, they also urged women to demand a respectful attitude um, and clear information about the procedure. Most importantly, health feminists urged women who might otherwise feel vulnerable and overwhelmed to see themselves as legitimate partnership participants in the abortion process. They insisted that the consumers of abortion services, patients, or, or women, should influence the shape and the quality of the product. As one feminist activist put it, abortionists live off women. We can demand and get quality health care, or we can put the provider out of business. It was a different time when it was okay to think about putting providers out of business. Um, they understood that women, by withholding their abortion dollars from disrespectful doctors, could influence the export, uh, abortion experience of other women. Beyond providing general guidelines um, for choosing abortion providers, health feminists also issued warnings against particular individuals condemning in press and um, in the street the practices of unscrupulous or unskilled um, practitioners. This guy Harvey Carmen um, was a psych was a BS psychologist who um, was quite a famous. Um, illegal abortionist in California, also, and also invented a lot of abortion techniques. He was associated with the clinic in Philadelphia, Gosnell's Clinic, which um, several women over time um, died there um, from abortions. So Harvey Carmen was one of the targets. Um, they also challenged the um, politics and practices of Planned Parenthood an institution that many health feminists believed um, pretended to work for women while attempting to control and exploit them. Now, many health feminists viewed Planned Parenthood as a foe in feminist clothing. They attacked Planned Parenthood on at least three levels. They decried the international efforts and its connection to the population control industry which spearheaded the effort to solve the economic problems of the developing world by controlling women's reproduction. As one 1980 um, position paper framed it, Planned Parenthood is population control. For those who are fighting to control our bodies, we know that as long as population control exists, no woman can control her life. So this is what's taken in 1975 at a meeting of Planned Parenthood physicians. 
This is Carol Downer here, and this is Hugh Davis, the um, inventor of the Delcon Shield. This is actually before the Delcon Shield was seen as um, so problematic. But, um, little, here, little lady. Um, all right. S further health feminists understood that many women might unknowingly side with Planned Parenthood, particularly on the local level seeing it as a strong voice against the anti-abortion forces. Finally, many health feminists condemned Planned Parenthood's local politics. Time and again, feminists alleged, Planned Parenthood moved into communities only after independent abortion providers had gained community support for abortion and other reproductive services. Consequently, um, Planned Parenthood allegedly competed in the same communities for client and state dollars, while leaving many communities um, underserved by abortion providers. Health feminists understood that most women wanted a uh, physician-attended abortion, and they, um, and they were happy to provide advice about providers. Many believed, however, that medicalized abortion left women's bodies in doctors' hands, hands that might control or exploit them rather than fight for their liberation. As a result, health feminists with so, um, associated with self-help um, promoted non-medicalized pathways to reproductive self-control. They developed and promoted menstrual extraction. So, um, this is, so we met Lorraine Rothman earlier. So she invented um, a abortion technology called Delham, which was a form of menstrual uh, early abortion. So here you have a mason jar, uh, a very small flexible cannula is um, um, key aquarium tubing, a syringe that provides suction. With the syringe, uh, aquarium tubing, a mason jar, and a small flexible cannula, women in the presence of other women could extract their menses all at once at the beginning of their menstrual periods, or if a period was late, they could extract their endometrial lining. Although health feminists generally shied away from publicizing menstrual extraction um, as a form of abortion, at least in the 1970s they shied away from that, um, they did see regular menstrual extraction or menstrual extraction after unprotected sex as a feminist, women-centered form, perhaps the most feminist form um, of um, of fertility control. So here you can see um, the woman getting, having her menses extracted is in fact in charge of the syringe, so she's the one um, doing the extraction. It was firmly women controlled. It did not require medical or state permission. It created no systemic side effects. And after the initial setup, it was virtually free. It ensured that in the future, women did not have to beg for their right to control their fertility. I just want to take us back to um, Patricia McGinnis, um, one of the early abortion um, advocates in California. And this is, um, this is the place they never want to return back to. So, Please, may I have a U.S. Supreme Court approved politician, politician sanctioned psychiatrist rubber stamped clergy council residency investigative committee inspector therapeutic to U.S. Health Department status, size, contraceptive value, religious sect, guilt surmounted of abortion. So, this idea that women are in the always get having to um, justify their desire for an abortion by the state, by medicine by the clergy. So this is what um, menstrual extraction would allow women to avoid. So
So a third project um, of the women's health movement that I want to talk about is um, a call to attention to lesbian health matters. Although lesbians had always been part of the women's health movement, over time, the, leg the um, reproductive health focus of the movement um, frustrated many of them. For example, when Francie Hornstein um, and two of her friends moved from Iowa City to Los Angeles to dedicate their efforts to self-help and the broader women's health movement, a lesbian in Los Angeles asked them, why would three nice lesbians like you want to work so hard for straight women? The allegation then was that the movement left lesbian um, needs unidentified and unmet, and the pernicious health effects of homophobia unchallenged and unexplored. Some lesbians then saw the movement as dependent on lesbian labor while draining resources away from the lesbian. Community. Hornstein viewed this critique as misguided. She argued that lesbians, like all women, would benefit from learning about their bodies from self-help. Um, quote, for lesbians, the gynecological self-help movement is much like a course in self-defense, she said. For as lesbians, we are most likely to be intimidated, patronized, and literally ostracized by a male-dominated medical establishment which knows nothing and cares less about the kinds of health care um, lesbians need and want. Hornstein further insisted that because all women could be raped, all women should have access to woman-controlled forms of contraception. Nevertheless, she urged the movement to develop more lesbian-centered programming, including lesbian self-help demonstrations and study groups. Other participants in the women's health movement took up the call for more research on lesbian health needs. The most important product of this effort was the 1979 pamphlet, Lesbian Health Matters. This resource was created by four lesbian-identified women um, health activists in Santa Cruz, um, and it attempted to identify lesbian health needs. Now, lesbian Health Matters sought to consolidate information specific to lesbians, provide information without heterosexist bias on a variety of health topics, menopause, self-care, alcoholism, educate healthcare providers about the healthcare needs of lesbians, and build, quote, strength and solidarity between and among lesbians. The pamphlet engaged with issues of particular concern to lesbians, including alternative fertilization um, options and um, issues shared by straight and gay women um, from a lesbian perspective. The book makes the practical, avoid coffee um, while battling a bladder infection, with the political. Um, lesbians often turn to alcohol to escape the stresses of homophobia. In the end, the book identified the need for more research about lesbian health. The author suspected, for example, that certain health conditions were more common, for example, breast cancer and alcoholism, or less common, syphilis and cervical cancer, in lesbians than in straight women, but they called for more research to provide more accurate answers. And those questions about, um, is um, breast cancer more common in lesbians, and if so, is it connected to their being lesbian, um, is still an issue um, that's, that's debated. Now, Lesbian Health Matters gave lesbians a health resource of their own, but it also highlighted a problem at the Center for the Demand of Women's Health Research. What matters define the contours of lesbian health? Was breast cancer a lesbian health issue because lesbians were allegedly more at risk? 
Um, were yeast infections in lesbians any different from yeast infections in um, straight women? Was alcohol use in lesbians more common and more harmful in lesbians because of the importance of bar culture? Were there or should there be lesbian specific treatment protocols? And perhaps the most difficult question um, at the center of women's health re um, research was who counts as a lesbian anyway? Um, people went into this um, handbook thinking that this was a self-evident issue, and it has proven um, for the last 40, um, 50 years actually quite, quite tricky. All right. I want to just um, say briefly that we have this pamphlet, Lesbian Health um, Matters in 1979. This um, Institutes of Medicine um, report that comes out in 1990 is sort of the next um, important look at lesbian health. So it's um, takes a long time to get lesbian health on the agenda. And that's, um, and the issues um, described in the, this Lesbian Health, um, Institutes of Medicine Lesbian Health Guide were much the same um, 20 years later. All right. While lesbian health research occupied some health feminists, others understood that health care centers free from homophobia and heterosexism would improve health access to lesbians and thus improve their health. As a result, um, health feminists also created lesbian health clinics. A clinic might um, consist of one night a month, or in some cities, one night a week, where lesbians could be seen by lesbian health care workers sometimes physicians, but more often lay health workers. Um, these efforts were generally short-lived projects, lasting a few months or, in a couple cases, a few years. But some lesbian health clinics had legs. Um, I want to introduce you to two of them. Um, the St. Mark's Women's Health Collective in New York City and the Lion Martin Women's um, Health Services in San Francisco. Now, St. Mark's Community um, Clinic began in 1970 as a community clinic to meet the health needs of the street kids um, and other medically underserved population in Manhattan's East Village. So this is sort of um, the Haight-Ashbury Clinic East, right? Um, it was directly inspired by the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic. Um, by 1973, however, lesbian volunteers at the clinic began to see lesbians as an underserved medical population that was not being served by this clinic. Um, and these volunteers particularly res resented that straight women might receive free medical screening from clinics supported by fe federal family um, planning funds. So straight women had access to free health care that lesbian women did not, or so they said. But these women, who eventually called themselves the Women's Health Collective, and, and sometimes the Lesbian Health Collective of St. Mark's Clinic, began offering a women's clinic one night a week in March 1974. So women's nights at St. Mark's Clinic were staffed by lesbian volunteers, and they were promoted to the lesbian community. Still, this collective refrained from calling it a lesbian clinic, at least in the early years. Collective members insisted that no woman would be turned away unless they were seeking only birth control or other reproductive services. So um, this clinic offered nothing to do with reproduction. Um, although they highlighted the need for the clinic by insisting that no illness should place us in the hands of professionals who have contempt for lesbianism and our rights as healthcare consumers, they explicitly um, welcomed older women to the clinic as women without reproductive health needs. So in some ways, this becomes the Women's Health Clinic of St. Mark's becomes a clinic for nuns, older women, so postmenopausal women, um, and lesbians, right? It's, it, it's quite a trio. Um, 
So the Women's Health Collective gradually came to control St. Mark's Community Clinic by taking over the board. So the lesbians take over this community clinic, um, and, it, and it's a hostile takeover. Um, over the board by there are questions, there's time for questions, perhaps. Um, and setting a quota for the numbers of men and physicians who could be on the, on, who could govern on the board. So that's how they kept control, by keeping the numbers of men and physicians low on the board. St. Mark's continued to offer general medical clinics two nights a week, um, staffed by male and female volunteers. And it also developed a gay men's night, um, staffed by gay men. So it continues to be a community clinic Run by, the, run by the lesbians, a lesbian clinic, um, and then the gay men's clinic. Now, St. Mark, Mark's Women's Health Collective disinclination to provide reproductive health services set them apart from other women's health clinics of the era. In other aspects, they were clearly part of the same activist impulse. In particular, they depicted themselves as a challenge to medicine as usual an alternative to the hierarchical male <coughs> medical model. As founder Barbara Herbert um, framed it, the clinic provided technicians to serve people, not professionals to give answers. The collective also believed that the value of their e efforts transcended the particularities of um, mere healthcare. They believed, or at least most of them believed, that they were working towards women's liberation. Over time, however, collective members came to rethink their relationship to healthcare as a goal in itself. So they started out thinking that healthcare is a, is a means to a different, to the goal of women's liberation. But as Herbert described it, in the beginning, the collective members were people who believed in liberation in destroying hierarchy and smashing the patriarchy. I love it that people talk about smashing the patriarchy. Um, and then we came up against bad diseases. In the face of significant illness and scant resources that limited healthcare options, the greatest immediate service that the healthcare could provide was access to care. As a result, the collective that once pursued liberation as its goal um, eventually focused on securing the right to care and providing health services. Was it something I said? <laughs> um, by the end of the decade, the clinic's internal relationships began to fray, due primarily over um, sexual politics and the place of um, uh, and the place of alternative health care. Men, particularly male physicians, staffing men's nights resented their weak representation on the governing board. Physicians, some of those associated with the women's collective, also grew uncomfortable with the alternative healing methods offered on women's nights. Women's nights, lesbian women's nights, there are alternative healing methods there, um, and many of the physicians grew uncomfortable with that. Tensions over these two issues and others grew intolerable, and in 1980, the clinic split into two factions. One Saint, they say they they keep the name. So one Saint Marks, governed by the Women's Health Collective, continued to offer health care to lesbians and older women until 1995. Another Saint Marks continued initially offered health care to three discrete populations: the general public, gay men, and lesbians. Um, this latter Saint Marks. Um, increasingly focused on the health needs of gay men after the emergence of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I think um, since I heard the 40 minute alarm, we're going to. Blind Martin Clinic is in San Francisco, which begins as a lesbian clinic. I, I would say at this point in time, it's primarily a trans health clinic, which, as you might imagine, was a painful and difficult transition. Um, so, but let me conclude here. Women's health movement was an effort to increase women's control over their own well bodies. As a result, health feminists created technologies, places, and practices. Self-exam, menstrual extraction, participatory clinics, 
health centers to encourage women to trust themselves and other women as experts and to resist abdicating responsibility for their bodies to the medical profession. They understood that a speculum, a mirror, and a flashlight would not secure liberation, but they insisted that without bodily autonomy, liberation was impossible. Health feminists also fought for abortion on demand, and what they received was access to state and medical control of abortion. They believed that many advocates for abortion access were more invested in controlling women than, having, than giving women control. Consequently, health feminists fought to create feminist abortions, both in feminist clinic spaces and as a shared ideal that could influence the abortion marketplace. And finally, women's health activists strove to identify and meet the health needs of lesbians as well as straight identified women. Although it remains unclear what lesbian health should encompass and who should re receive care at a lesbian health clinic, health feminists insisted, at least after the little prodding, um, that lesbian health matters be part of the movement's agenda. Consequently, lesbians, at least in a handful of cities, could receive care in non-homophobic, non-heterosexist environments. If there is a take-home message in this history, it's that dedicated health feminists, working tirelessly and against the odds, enacted a new and powerful vision of women's health care. Although they did not um, destroy the patriarchy, although they tried, um, or medicine as usual, they changed, at least for a moment, and at least for some women, women's relationship to their bodies. At our particularly grim moment in time, this message um, provides inspiration and hope. All right, that's it.
right? And they saw this as a real improvement. Um, nevertheless, other health feminists saw um, said that's not the answer because we don't want women experts that insist that that women like me shouldn't have access to their body, right? They still, they resisted any kind of um, separation of women from their own bodies. It's not that these women didn't think physicians were useful in cancer and diabetes, but in terms of just routine maintenance, right? Care of a well woman's body, they thought that medicine was the problem, not necessarily, or not exclusively, medicine and sort of medicine's encroachment on things that should look to, to women. That was, there, was a, there was a question though? Or a comment? There's a question about the sex action. Yeah. Is there any like, issues with the or is it Sure. Menstrual extraction was clearly radical. I mean, super radical. And plenty of women um, in the women's liberation movement thought you folks are are foolish and reckless and dangerous, right? Um, but the women who um, deployed it and promoted it as um, said, no, um, it's perfectly safe. So do I know no um, sort of feminist controlled menstrual extraction that had any problems, right? Um, now certainly this is a technology that's also being used roughly in doctor's offices, right? This is also um, you know, menstrual regulation, or there's a lot of words for this early kind of suction abortion, um, all, always done before a positive pregnancy test. But yeah, as, as nervous as this makes so many of us, um, the women I study say, it was perfectly safe, and there has never been any evidence shown um, otherwise, right? Um, there's no perforated uteri in this. So, so there you go. Um, but, and then, I mean, we talk, so in the 1970s, um, this was sort of down, on the down low an abortion procedure. In the 90s, as more and more abortion rights were being eroded, they started coming out more um, um, in the in the daylight with this as an abortion um, method. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a question. It was just, I just wanted to thank you for your talk. Um, oh, thank you. I, I think that it's really Lobbying for um, 
those safe spaces um, for protesters, right? That um, abortion was being so um, violently attacked um, that independent feminist abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood, they, they stood together um, as a unified front. Now, some of those feminist clinics still sort of held their nose, right? Um, but nevertheless, they thought, so, so I would say it hasn't gone away completely, but as, as there are fewer and fewer abortion providers, Planned Parenthood is key to the survival of abortion provision um, in many communities. So you can't, um, that limits the rhetoric, I think. And I think the population, the larger critique of the population control industry has just um, diminished, I think. Yeah, Gloria? Well, I just want to follow the previous comment that here in, in Madison, uh, abortion was pretty open prior to Roe v. Wade. You had to have a medical reason to have an abortion. Well, we just got hooked up with a couple of psychiatrists who would be frequently writing the note saying that it was important uh, to the woman. And then after the Roe v. Wade, we had a clinic that we would run like every Tuesday. And uh, there would be counselors there, and we would do abortions almost all morning. And then we do a you know, second or third trimester abortions well. So we had a four bed unit for that purpose. So we were pretty much on top of it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so even before Roe v. Wade, um, in almost all states, you could get a therapy, you could ask for a therapy, apply for a therapy of abortion. But as you said, um, Laura, you needed two psychiatrists to sign off. In some states, this sort of just said no, essentially no abortions, even though theoretically you could. But Wisconsin, I, I think somebody, I hope a graduate student sometime will come and write a history of abortion provision in Wisconsin, because it's a really interesting um, history. It's sort of um, also Wisconsin spearheaded um, in clinic, um, in doctor's office abortions, right? So um, anyway, but this is, that sort of um, therapeutic, this application of begging for um, a uh, therapeutic abortion is what's going on in this slide. Now, in some states, maybe it was in Wisconsin, it was really a rubber stamp, right? It was easy to get one. In other states, it was very difficult. And there was a hand somewhere in here. Yeah. I suppose this might also be a question for the history of abortion in Wisconsin, but um, we talk about Planned Parenthood coming into places that are the best providers. I don't know if that historically happened here, like if we already had another clinic, but when I think of it, it's where our providers actually tend to go to perform abortion. So without that, the providers, we have the providers, but no place to legally do it. So I just didn't know what to do. Did we push out a different clinic that I never knew about? I Yeah, do you know about Liz Carlin? Uh, so, yeah, we used to have, um, it didn't used to be the case, and that's even in the sort of, um, in the 1990s, there were um, Planned Parenthood, gosh, now I don't want to be quoted, but Planned Parenthood was not actually where you got your abortions in Madison, right? Um, and that has changed fairly recently.
probably not exercising the vote um, is completely dangerous and dangerous to himself, right? Um, there's absolutely um, no doubt about that, at least to me. Now, whether what kind of um, power that is, I'd like to say that's really powerful. Um, there's more women than men. Yes, but in the last um, <clears throat> in the last election, women did not necessarily vote to um, further women's health access, for example. So, um, boy, I love this question, and I've, <laughs> I've got to find something for her to carry, right? Or brandish, right? Um, let me. I don't think of, an IUD. <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh. Um, the women I studied would, set, would definitely not do that, um, in part because IUDs are easy to put in and then, and then less easy to take out, right? And so, in some ways, um, or that you have to go ac get access to a physical. It's completely medically controlled, right? It's a great form of birth control, absolutely. Um, but, but these women would say that it's absolutely a medical control. Um, it's even a population control, right? Because it's about making sure women don't, particularly certain women, don't have any, children, any more children, right? Um, so, but, so my woman would not brandish the IUD. It's interesting what else what she would hold. And maybe it's just my sort of discouragement at this particular moment that I don't have anything, I don't have a weapon for her. 